Matthew here from MiniWarGaming.com. And this video is going to be very different from any other video that we've ever created. And that is because this is an open letter to Games Workshop. So I am actually going to be addressing Games Workshop in this. And no, this is not going to be a rant. I'm not here to just go ahead and criticize Games Workshop and everything that they do. This is meant just to discuss some really important issues that have come up over the past few years and the experience that we have had as Mini Wargaming running an online store, running our local store, creating videos, and basically trying to create a really good Wargaming-based website, where, of course, Games Workshop products are a big factor, as they are currently the most popular in the world. So I want to talk about three major things. And just so you know, for everybody else who's watching this, we are not going to enable any advertising on this video or anything else. So we're not trying to make any ad revenue or money off of this video. So what we'd love that you do is if you agree with what I'm saying, post this video somewhere else, on your blog, discuss it on forums, anywhere that you can to get as much exposure to this video as possible so that it's more likely to get Games Workshop's attention, especially if you agree with everything I'm about to talk about. So the first issue that I need to talk about is the way that Games Workshop treats the internet, or more particularly, online retailers. See, the major problem is that Games Workshop, when they first started their business, the internet did not exist. And I realized that that was the case, and so they kind of grew up at the time that the internet started as well. In fact, the internet probably started halfway through their current life. And so at that point, what we had was we had first off the dot-com bubble burst, where anybody who created a website became a millionaire, and that quickly died away. And then after that, you still had internet retailers whose sole purpose was to create a really quick website, work out of their basements, offer deep discounts, and gouge local retailers. And that was what was happening. And so I understand why Games Workshop back earlier, eight years, 10 years ago, made the decision to want to turn off basically all online retailers. Now the law prevented them from doing this in most countries except the United States. But in the US they were able to say, if you want to sell our product, you can no longer sell online. And maybe that was necessary at that point. I'm not completely convinced that it was. But what has happened since is that the world of e-commerce has changed dramatically. You will no longer see those basement businesses for a couple reasons. One, because Games Workshop, you now require people to have a brick and mortar store. And so if you make certain minimum requirements there, then it should eliminate the people who have zero expenses and therefore work by themselves, sell it at 35% off, and everybody likes to buy from them. The second thing is, because the internet has grown so much, competition has grown, which means costs increase in order to run a business. If you look at the major stores out there, you have our store, Mini Wargaming, in the States you have things like the War Store, Miniature Market, and you, in the UK and Europe you have Wayland Games and Maelstrom Games. There's lots of other ones, I'm not going to try to mention them all, those are the first ones that come to my mind. These stores have a few things in common. One, they have several employees. Two, they have local stores. And in some cases, I was actually looking at a video for Miniature Market, they have a huge local store that sells tons of Games Workshop products. And so these are not basement dwelling companies whose sole purpose is just to keep their costs down as low as possible so that they can sell the products as cheap as possible and gouge the market, basically freeloading off of the efforts of Games Workshop as well as all the independent retailers. That has pretty much disappeared. And I realize that you know who your clients are, so there might still be some doing that. But I know of websites that sell at a steeper discount than anybody else, and they don't get a lot of business because it's just not the same experience. There's too much competition, and people want to buy from who they like and who they trust, and that is why those websites are disappearing. So maybe it's time to rethink that. Here is what I suggest doing. Stop discriminating against online stores. Allow them to use your images. I realize they're your images. I realize that you put money into making those images. But that is more the reason to get even more money out of the work that you put into them. If I were selling a product and I had tons of people selling it for me, and I had put lots of money into developing the miniature, painting the miniature, and taking really good pictures of it, photoshopping it afterwards, or whatever I had to do, and then I said, well, I'm only going to use this on my website and in my catalogs, that would be kind of foolish. Because it's all these other people who will sell more of my product so I make more money, if I let them use it. You know, I can lay out a license. They're only allowed to use it if they're selling my product. They can only use it to promote my product, and, but they can use it commercially as long as they are selling our products. That would make you more money. In fact, I noticed when we had to take down all our images, because at one point we did use Games Workshop images in our store, 
and then you sent us a notice saying remove all those images. We noticed a decrease in sales when we took down those images. So that means that you made less money and maybe you think that you didn't because you think, well, if you didn't sell it, then some local retailer did or maybe we did on our website or in one of our stores. But that is not the case. Just because somebody doesn't buy somewhere, it doesn't mean they will buy it somewhere else. For some people, that was the option they wanted to use and so you missed the impulse buy while they happened to be watching one of our videos and they wanted a product. They go there, there's no picture, you miss that impulse buy, it's not like all of a sudden they're going to say, you know what, forget this, I'm going to go to my local store and buy it. You lose sales, not just us, but you lose sales as well. I realize that when you sell to your independent retailers, you do not make as much as when you sell it yourself, but that doesn't matter. If you're going to use independent retailers, you need to support them in what they do. So, allow us to have internet websites. I realize this would create more competition for myself, but to tell you the truth, it would help the entire market. The second thing is allow us to use your images and heck, cooperate with us and provide us with things that we need in order to sell online. You already do it really well for your local stores. Why not do it for the online ones as well, especially since all of the basement dwelling ones have pretty much disappeared. The second problem that I want to talk about is the currency exchange problem. Now, this is a difficult one. And I realize that. I realize that currency exchange rates are constantly fluctuating and you are a global business. That you are set up not only in Europe, and not only in the US, and not only in Canada, but in other places in the world. And so your costs fluctuate simply because of currency exchange. I realize the frustration of this is I also buy products from overseas and from the States that I sell in my store. So I know what it's like to deal with currency exchange. Maybe not to the same level that you do, but I understand the basic principles. What you have chosen to do is set prices that basically shield you from any currency exchange problem. So, you know, if the dollar fluctuates or the pound fluctuates, you should still be okay because you set the prices so that if it fluctuates, at least it won't go past and help and make you make a lot less money. But that might have worked years ago. But when it comes down to it, we are in a global market. Most of your market, if not all of them, are tech savvy. The, the, the age range, the demographics that you're looking at, they are online. They visit websites, they go to miniwargaming.com, they go to Beasts of War, they go to Warseer and other forums. They go to these websites regularly. So they are fully aware of what the prices in different countries are. In fact, they talk about it on the forums, they talk about it in videos. Most people are aware that if they buy it from one country, it's cheaper than another. In fact, until the recent um, restriction that you put on the European stores to sell to overseas or to Australia or other countries. There was even people that I know in my own store who could buy from the UK stores for cheaper than I could possibly get it at wholesale. And so to them, and it actually arrives still pretty quickly because you know mail has increased in technology and things are getting here faster. So the overseas, the size of the Atlantic Ocean is getting smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of shipping times. You are dealing with a global market. You can no longer afford to sell at one price to somebody and another price to somebody else. Now I realize that as a business that is very difficult to, to rectify because if all of a sudden you align the prices, the currency exchange changes, and you have to align the prices again, and a product that you're selling today you might have made a few months ago at a different currency exchange rate and so it might have cost you more to make that and then you're selling it for less because of the currency exchange fluctuations. I realize that is the reason why you have set the prices the way you do. But what you can do instead for example, I would love, as a Canadian merchant, to purchase the products in U.S. dollars. Your products are based in the U.S., they might be made in the U.S., either way you got them to the U.S. and they are being shipped to me. So if you sell it to me in U.S. dollars, you don't have to worry about currency fluctuation. I also realize it might cost a little bit more to get it to Canada, so I would expect a little bit of an increase in some sort of cost, maybe even charging me shipping, and then I would be able to get it at U.S. dollars. Currently. The US dollar is worth 93 to 98 cents, depending on whether you're buying or selling, of a Canadian dollar. Whereas before it was worth $1.10, $1.20, and even as high as $1.30. So the prices have become so significantly different that it really affects our business. And you might think, hey, that's a great thing, but it's not allowing Canadians to buy from Canadians more, it's just allowing Canadians to buy from Americans and Americans to buy elsewhere as well. So it's not a solution. It's also not a solution to put up a fence around areas and say, you know, in Europe, you're not allowed to sell outside of Europe. That is going to hurt loyalty, which we'll talk about in a second. Instead, what you need to do is sell to Canadians in US dollars and sell to Australians in British pounds. 
It's very easy to do now with the current market the way it is. My credit card lets me buy in any currency that I want and they'll do the exchange. Some credit cards will even charge people for the exchange rate, but that's what they have to deal with if they want to deal with an overseas company. And I realize also that it might be more expensive to get your product to Australia. So there might be additional costs that won't be exactly equal from buying from one or the other, but it will align the costs a lot more. So no more of this currency exchange huge difference that allows people to buy overseas at way better prices. If you want to fix it, don't restrict merchants and call them freeloaders at the same time. What you need to do is change your business practice to align to the market the way it is today, not the way it was 20 years ago. The last thing I want to talk about is competition. Now, up until now, you've been your own thing, you've had a monopoly on the market, and you're able to do pretty much whatever you want with whatever repercussions because there's not really a substitute. There are a ton of other miniature companies out there, but you know that you are the best. And when it comes to it, I agree. You make the best miniatures at the quantity that you do. There might be some other individual mar er, companies that make better miniatures, but they do it in such small scale that they're not really a substitute in terms of I'll play that game instead of Warhammer. When people come into my, uh, my store, I know that the, one of the biggest factors of what game they're going to play is what does everybody else play. Because the last thing you want to do is start a game by yourself and not have anybody else to play against. So you have the monopoly, however you're losing it. And not because of something that you've done, but more because the market is evolving and that other companies are going bigger, especially companies like Privateer Press. I'm sure that you're aware that they're taking more and more of the market. You might not be worried about them yet, but they are getting bigger. So the biggest thing that you need at this time is well, actually two big things, is one better loyalty from your own fans. You already have a lot of loyalty, but there are a lot of things that you've done in the past few years that have hurt that loyalty. And while people might moan and complain and make ignorant results as to why they're no longer going to buy GW products, the truth is they didn't really have a choice. They either had to quit the hobby or you know, fork out the cash and the price increases or whatever they had to do. So there's a better way to approach this with PR. And I'll give you a few examples. First off, you shouldn't call one of your biggest clients a freeloader. I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about one of your UK stores. When you decided to put your trade embargo, you actually used the word that they are freeloading off of the work in Australia. And while that might be partially true, because they're not really adding to the Australian market with what they're doing, calling your biggest client, or one of your biggest clients, a freeloader cannot help PR. Because if they're your biggest client, first off, you're hurting your relationship with them. Second off, they're going to pass on that information to their clients. And if they're one of your biggest, that means they have a lot of your customers who are listening to them. And so that is really bad PR and is not going to help loyalty. And in fact, I saw everywhere people were complaining about that. And I realized that people will complain. Don't get me wrong. People complain about things that we do. If our, our videos aren't quite as good or other things that happen, they'll complain. And that's just the nature of you know, people in general. You'll see complaints as you get to be a bigger company. But there is a certain point where you have to sit back and think, should we have done that? Is there something that we should do about it? Another thing would be the recent resin price increase trade embargo combination. Now, I like the resin miniatures. I know that there is some miscast going on. I know that some people are complaining about that quality. But in the end, I, th I think they're great. I think that they are a very high quality miniature and that over time, they'll become a really a big mainstay in your lines. But when you released the resin ones, you had at the same time or around the same time announced another price increase. Now, even our educated customers thought that you were raising the prices because you were coming up with resin. In fact, I even thought that until I got the list of things that you were changing the prices on and I realized that books were included in it and plastic miniatures were included in it and I realized, oh yeah, it's June. This is when Games Workshop does a price increase. So doing it simultaneously to that actually made pretty much everybody think that you were doing it because you were switching to resin. And the common knowledge is that resin is cheaper than metal. Now whether that is the case in your situation, I don't know. I don't know exactly what kind of resin, I don't know your costs. But the common, uh, what people think mostly is that resin is cheaper than metal. So by switching to something that had a perception of being cheaper and at the same time announcing a price increase, that was a lot of flack that you received unnecessarily. If they were done separately, then people will complain about resin and they would complain about price increase, but they're going to complain anyway about any changes. Uh, like my mother complains every time a software change happens in one of her programs because she hates change. People don't like change. So you know that you have to deal with any backlash whenever you make any changes to anything that you do. But at least people wouldn't see it as, hey guys, we're switching to a cheaper method and we're going to increase prices at the same time. And that is what the, the way people saw it. And it took a lot of convincing 
to certain people to say, no, it's nothing to do with that. Resin might be cheaper, but they're just doing their price increase as normal. And then in the same time, within a week or two of it, announcing that you're doing that embargo or whatever you want to call it, that European stores can't sell outside of Europe, that's just a triple whammy at the same time. So people are like, well, not only are they doing this and doing this and doing this, and they put out all together, and that might actually be enough for them to lose all loyalty and switch companies, quit the hobby, or whatever they are going to do. So individually, they would, they would have created complaints, but most people would have you know, forgot about it and moved on, especially when they saw the quality of the resin miniatures. The second thing, the price increase, people always complain about that, and then they move on and they buy what they can. And then the third thing, the European embargo thing, you know, people would have complained about that. That's bad PR. Maybe you could have phrased it better or maybe not done it at all and just changed the way that you do pricing. But they would have eventually forgot about it and moved on. But putting all three together was probably a bad PR move. As other companies rise in power and they get stronger, they will become a substitute. They already are. Privateer Press Products and other companies are already a substitute. We have a lot of War Machine and Hordes players in our club and we have a lot of Warhammer players, but War Machine has definitely been growing in popularity very, very rapidly. Which means when somebody comes into our store and there's loyalty issues with GW and there's not with Privateer Press, there's more of a chance that they're gonna do that. Or people who are already in Warhammer might switch over when they see that War Machine and Hordes is not doing the same thing that you are doing, at least not right now. Maybe once they're bigger, they'll make some of the same mistakes. Which brings me to the last point when it comes to talking about competition. You need to really take a look at your starter sets and how much it costs to get into the hobby. I remember my first experience at the Games Workshop. I walked in, I was greeted by a really good, enthusiastic Games Workshop employee, and he got me excited about Lord of the Rings. And when I asked him how much, or what did I need to get started, he showed me the Minds of Moria box set, and it was like 80 or $90 at the time. And I didn't really think about it. It was like, yeah, 80 $90, it's pretty expensive, but you know, I'll get into it. But now you have other companies that you can get started for 50 bucks. A battle box from War Machine is $50. I realize that we are talking about completely different things. Mines of Moria, Assault on Black Reach, they have tons of miniatures in them. They are so worth the price that you're charging. In fact, they are one of the most cost-effective things. But it doesn't change the fact that that is your starter set. That is a set people need to buy, typically, to get started. And if they don't buy that, they have to buy a $70 rule book instead, and a battle force or whatever else they're gonna do to get started. And that is just not a good way to get started. A big question I have all the time, how much does it cost to play this game? And when it's War Machine, I can say, well, you get a battle box for $50 and you've got enough to get started. You have enough to play a game, you have enough to get going. But if I say, you need Assault on Black Reach, which is $120 now in Canada, you've just raised the price on that. And that does not cover the glue or all these other things, which I realize you also need to buy for the Privateer Press one. All of a sudden that adds up to 140, 150, 160 dollars. And uh, the mother with her 13 year old kid is going, holy cow, if that's just what it costs to get started. Obviously it's gonna cost even more to really get into it. So you need to reevaluate how you're gonna handle that. There's a lot of ways obviously you can deal with that. You've probably already thought of them in your marketing, but you need to think about them a lot more because substitutes are coming in. You had the monopoly for years, that is no longer going to be the case. You probably have a decade, maybe two decades at most before Privateer Press is pretty much able to take the business that they need. They're not going to put you out of business, but you are going to notice if you haven't already that they are going to take a chunk of it. And then other companies are going to follow suit. And over the next 10 to 20 years, you're going to see that popularity rise. And you know what? You started it. You got everybody into wargaming. You really made it popular. You're the reason that we all love this. But that means that you need to be careful that you're not the same thing. Like it happens in history with other companies. Often the first company that comes along in a market, the second company that comes after them really beats out that first company. Because the first company creates the market and the second company sees everything they're doing wrong and does it right. If you look at car companies, Ford started, GM came in, GM is doing better, or at least was doing better. I'm not gonna try to comment on that for current times. But the same thing happens in so many different markets where the one pioneers and the second one comes in and says, hey, that's a great idea, but I have a better way to do it. And they do better. So you gotta be careful that you don't become that first company that created the market and then loses it because they, they lose touch with it and they ignore new technologies and everything else. Especially when everything that you're doing, you talk about you don't like online marketers or online retailers and you have an online site that's available all over the world with inexpensive shipping and really fast everything. You're competing against your own retailers, which I realize you have to do because of your business model, but you need better PR. So this is my open letter to you, Games Workshop. I hope that it's come across professional. I'm not trying to rant. 
I'm just trying to give constructive criticism on the way that I've seen you running your business for the past three years. I personally love your games. I think there's some balance issues in 40K, but who doesn't? I think that uh, you make awesome miniatures. It's an awesome experience that you have created for wargamers everywhere in the world. It's just time for you to realize that there's things that you need to change if you want to keep up with the market. Because I don't want to see you lose market share. I want to see you still a nice big mark, uh, company. I want to see Privateer Press get up there as well, but I'd rather see the market expand rather than just part of it shift over to another company. Because it will benefit us all, especially us as online retailers and as stores. We'll make more money if you're making more money. And so we want you to make more money. So we want you to do the things the way you should be. And a lot of things you do right, but other things you need to change. So this is Matthew from Mini Wargaming. If you're watching this and you're not Games Workshop, go ahead and spread this around. If you agree with everything I said, feel free to post below. You can rant, you can criticize what I've said, you can, I don't care what you say, just try to keep it civil. Try to think about what you are arguing about and try to actually know what you're talking about before you just go and complain ignorantly about something that you know nothing about. Matthew from Mini Wargaming, happy Wargaming.